Welcome back, everybody. So for the past 12 years, Iceland has been called the best place in the world to be a woman. And our next guest is about to tell us why. She's got a brand new book, and it is entitled Secrets of the Sprakar. Canadian-born First Lady of Iceland, Eliza Reid, shares all the reasons why Iceland is leading the fight for gender equality and female empowerment. And all the way live from Iceland, she joins us now. Welcome back. Hi, thanks for inviting me back. This is so great that we can do this, you know, with this technology. So listen, uh, maybe people know it, maybe they don't know. You grew up in a small town uh, here in Canada. So big shout out to you, Ashton, Ontario. Um, yeah. So you know what it's like to be a woman in this country. So compare and contrast with what it's like being a woman in Iceland. Yeah, thanks for the question. I think, you know, maybe it's a bit that in Iceland, I really feel like we have passed the point here as a society about debating whether gender equality is important, but how we're going to get there. So in the countries mm. here, we see a lot of women in visible leadership roles. We have almost equal gender parity in parliament, 47.5%. We have a female prime minister, a female bishop of the national church, and head of the police. And I think seeing all these role models and strong positions is so important. But conversely, you know, we also see a lot of dads pushing strollers around the city and in the parks. And we see huge billboards for members of both the men's and women's national sports teams. And all of that really kind of mixes together to show that hopefully we're, you know, we're all working together towards realizing how important a role we can all play in our society. And then there's also progressive legislations. Um, Iceland's fertility rate is one of the highest in Europe. So what are the actual infrastructures that are in place that encourage people to have kids? Right, well, legislative wise, there is uh, excellent parental leave policies, which is paid by the government, not by someone's employer. And it's called a use it or lose it policy, which means that one parent has a several months, the other parent has several months, and then there's a third section of several months that you can split between you. But you're not allowed to have just one parent take all of the leave, which of course generally encourages fathers to take a lot of paternity leave and really starts them on the road of having a close relationship with their children. And then once they start in preschool, or even a child minder is even younger than that, that is also heavily subsidized, which means that families can decide, hopefully, the size of the family they want to based on what they want, whether they're able to, but less having to have finance factor into it. Wow, that wow. is so fascinating. Let's go deeper into parenting because you say, generally speaking, parenting is very different in Iceland than it is, let's say, here in Canada. How so? Well, you know, we all love our children everywhere in the world. So that that is no different. But I think that there's less helicopter parenting here in Iceland. So kids are really given responsibilities that probably you and I had when we were growing up. You know, I walked to school by myself all the time when I was going to school. And we see that here in Iceland still, that kids go to school by themselves. They come home by themselves. Um, they're trusted to run little errands at the shop from, from quite a young age. Um, and again, there's still a sort of social support network. So there are often extended family members around who, who can help out. And I think then the fact that it's pretty normal to see, say, a six, a seven, an eight-year-old out on the street, they're almost uh, less of a target sometimes because there's so many of them. And they, you know, will ask another adult for directions if they need it or, or an adult will help them out if they need it. And I think that's probably the biggest difference that you see between kids here in Iceland and kids in Canada. That was, yeah, that's the part that's so fascinating to me when you said that it's very routine to see a seven-year-old grocery shopping, like for a small thing, um, yeah, which yeah. not something you see everywhere. Yeah, I think that if you saw that here, a phone call would be made and not a good one. <laughs> but, <laughs> <No>. <laughs> but anyway, you write a chapter in your book about how gender equality goes hand in hand with stigma-free sexuality. So why has Iceland succeeded in this when so many other countries have failed to grasp this concept? Yeah, I have a chapter in the book called Stigma-Free Sexuality. And the idea, I guess, is that, you know, there's 
there's less of a, when it relates to gender equality, less of a difference between men and women. So, you know, it's not that men are encouraged to go out and, and sleep around or something, um, that, that women aren't judged for if they choose to engage in such behavior or not, um, that, that women are also seen to be beings who are absolutely fine to engage in consensual behavior. It's very common to have um, young single mothers, for example. People have children from a young age. Most parents aren't married when they have children. But, you know, conversely, we have Europe's highest rate of chlamydia infections. So, you know, nothing is perfect. We, you know, we also have issues of gender-based violence and, and sexual assault, and we need to work to improve on that. Um, you know, some would argue that because, uh, A, it's a smaller population, maybe relatively speaking, in Iceland, um, and also a lack of diversity, that some would argue what you're seeing is better equality for white Icelandic women. So, you know, let's let's tackle intersectionality here, because you say you interviewed dozens of women for the book uh, from all walks of life living in Iceland, including marginalized groups and women of color. So what challenges continue to persist for them when it comes to gender equality? That's a great question, because I think, you know, gender equality isn't for one group of privileged people. We can't achieve gender equality if, if we don't have everybody with us. And more marginalized groups are more at risk of being excluded. Um, I'm an immigrant to Iceland myself, and, and I absolutely fall into the, most cat the category of the most privileged immigrants, but I'm nevertheless an immigrant and have learned the language. And, you know, here in Iceland, for example, we can't exclude immigrant women from the dialogue. We can't leave behind women with disabilities or women, uh, you know, non-binary women and trans women, and we need to include everybody in that dialogue, and, and we mustn't forget that. And that was important to me when I was talking and telling the stories of all of these sprakar, which means outstanding women, um, that, that, that definition doesn't just belong to one sort of subset of women. Um, so let's now uh, talk about you being a role model, because you really are for so many women out there. And you write in your book that you actually suffer from uh, perhaps a degree of imposter syndrome, uh, because, you know, you do hear that word role model a lot. So let's unpack a little bit, get on our couch here, our proverbial couch, <laughs> um, and how you balance the weight of your your label, the you know, the, the title that you have with this label of role model. So first lady and role model. How do you handle that? <laughs> It's a, it's a great question because I've spent a lot of time thinking about it, you know, that I had this platform all of a sudden. I was known as the first lady because of something that my husband did. So I, I was all of a sudden better known because of who I was married to than who I was as an individual. And especially when I'm talking about gender equality, I, I thought at first, well, I'm not allowed then to talk about something like gender equality because I didn't earn this platform myself. And then... I began to think, you know, if I have this platform, I can either do something positive with it or not. And that's what I really try to do now. And so I suppose when I think about this imposter syndrome, I think maybe I should kind of lean into that uncomfortable feeling. You know, maybe that's my own way of saying that I'm on the right path. And if we think about it, we are all role models for someone. You know, we're all, we all can be role models. We all are role models. And it's up to us whether we want to be positive or negative role models. What a great note to end on. Eliza, thank you so much for coming back on the show. We really, really enjoyed speaking with you. Thank you for inviting me back. Hello to Canada. <laughs> we look forward to seeing you in person next time. The book is called Secrets of the Sprakar, and it's out right now. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back.